So now we'll talk about the urinary system, the fifth topic. So generally, one of the major function of the uh, urinary system is excretion and as well as osmoregulation. If you can see from the, uh, from the picture, uh, this is an uh, albatross uh, bird, and it lives in, on, in the sea. And you, you can imagine it can drink a lot of salt water. Normally, if you drink a lot of salt water, this, this may cause illness. But this bird have managed to survive and they drink a lot of uh, salt water and they're still surviving. So what's happening for that bird? Before, uh, before knowing that, some uh, definition we need to be familiar with. Animals are classified according to the mode of osmoregulation into osmoconformers in which these marine animals are isoosmotic with their surroundings and do not regulate their osmolarity, okay? While osmoregulators, they, they regulate their osmolarity. So they expend energy to control the water uptake and the loss in a hyperosmotic or a hypoosmotic environment. So that's mean osmoregulator either live in a hyperosmotic, the surrounding environment have a high, high osmotic pressure, the in, internally, while hypo or hypoosmotic environment in which uh, this, uh, the, this, uh, this type of osmoregulator live in an environment that is surrounding uh, with lower osmotic pressure. As well, there are a tenohyaline, which in these types of animal, most animal cannot tolerate a significant change in external osmolarity. So in this, uh, in this case of animals, these animals will not. So, so for tyhaline, these animal cannot live in external osmolarity that have significant change with their uh, body. While your hyaline, it's animal that can survive large fluctuations in external osmolality. So, so as we said before, um, uh, the concentration of water and the soil and solutes must be maintained within a narrow limits. This osmoregulation regulates the solute concentration and the balance, concentration and balance, gain and loss of water. So you can see in freshwater animals, the freshwater animals, they show some adaptation that reduce the water uptake and the conserve solutes. While in desert and the marine animal, the face dehydrating environment then that can deplete uh, body water. So excretion is a very important process to get rid of nitrogenous metabolites and other waste products. So we have the concept one now to do a osmoregulation balance, uptake and loss of water and solutes. This osmoregulation is based largely on controlled the movement harakat solutes between internal fluids and external environment. So cells require a balance between uptake and loss of water. Otherwise, it will happen a dehydration for the animals. The osmolarity is the solute concentration of a solution which determine the movement of water across a, a selectively, selectively uh, permeable membrane. In other words, if two solutions are isoosmotic, in both solutions and on nafs osmotic pressure, the movement of water is equal in both directions. While if two solutions differ in osmolarity, the net flow of water from the hypoosmotic diluted to the hyperosmotic concentration. So that means water will move from the diluted concentration into the, uh, uh, from the diluted uh, solution into the concentrated solution. And as you can see from the figure, it's a good illustration to show how water is movement. So actually, the osmolarity 
can be interpreted أو ممكن نقول عليها it is the movement of water so you can see here a membrane which is selective permeable you can see that in this part in this half of the uh, tank you can see a lot of solutes and in this half of the tank you can see few solutes and a lot of water so the water the net movement of the water it will move from the high amount of water to the low amount of water it will move from the water will move from the diluted solution into concentrated solution the water moves from hypoosmotic side hypo means low osmotic pressure side to the hyperosmotic pressure side to the high osmotic uh, pressure side okay So what happened for marine animal? So you need to understand that marine animal lives in the sea water. So the sea water is considered to be hyperosmotic. So if they don't regulate their osmolarity, this will lead to dehydration because water will move from their body to the sea. So most marine animals or invertebrate or uh, most invertebrate are osmoconformous, while most marine vertebrate like the albatross, like the bird, and the, some invertebrates are osmoregulators. So they need to regulate the osmolarity. Marine bony fishes are hypoosmotic to sea water. They lose water by osmosis and they gain salt by diffusion uh, from the food and from the food. So the balance water loss by drinking sea water and the excreting salts. We shrub maya, we allow salts to regulate the amount of, to, to regulate the osmolarity. So you can see here how osmoregulation occur in marine fish which lives in an environment of high salt or environment of hyperosmotic pressure. So you can see the blue arrows represent the salt, while the, uh, the uh, white arrow represent water. So you can see the fish can gain water and the salt ions from the food. Can gain water and the salt ions from seawater, from drinking seawater. So now it has a lot of water inside its body, that contain a lot of salts. So it excretes salts from the gills. And the, the osmotic water loss through and the water as well from other parts of the body. As well, it ex excretes a lot of salt ions and a small amount of water in the urine. And that's why it is now trying to adjust the internal osmolarity of the animal to the external uh, osmolarity. So to, by controlling the amount of water lost from its body and as well the amount of salt lost from its body. And that's okay for osmoregulation in marine fish. What about freshwater animals? For freshwater animals, these constantly take water by osmosis from their hyposmotic environment. So this, since the animals live in fresh water, they live actually in a region of hyposmotic environment. So you can see they lose salt by diffusion and they maintain water balance by excreting large amount of diluted urine. And excreting large amount of diluted urine. So salts can be lost by diffusion and they can be, these salts can be replaced by food or by a pig through gills. So you can see here, this figure shows the osmoregulation in a freshwater fish. The same, the blue, dark blue is the salt, the light blue is the water. You can see that it gain water and the sum of the iron in the food. And you can see from the figure, from the kind of arrow, 
It's a thicker arrow for water, lesser arrow for salt. Why? Because the environment around it, it is a contain, uh, it's a, 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 it is diluted. It's a hypotonic, okay? Fewer amount of salt. So in, and as well, it uptakes salt ions from gills and uptake higher amount of water through the gills. After that, it regulates itself and loses a lot amount of water and the fewer amount of salt through the uh, urine to regulate its uh, uh, osmolarity. So what about the albatross bird? The one, the bird you remember that uh, uh, live in a, a very uh, high salt water uh, and it needs to regulate its osmolarity, otherwise it will, uh, it will be dehydrated. An example, one of the major organs that help these kind of birds to regulate its uh, uh, osmolarity is the presence of a nasal gland. So you can see here, let's have a pointer. So the presence of a nasal gland in marine birds as a general, remove excess sodium chloride salts from the blood. You can see the location of the nasal gland. And this nasal gland is connected by a duct to, to the outside and opens by a nostorial with salt secretion. So in this opening, salt are released. And this figure shows the location of the nasal gland in a marine gland. To be familiar, the blue arrow represents salt movement, while the red arrow represents the blood movement. If we enlarge a part of the uh, salt gland, you can see in this nasal gland or salt gland, this nasal gland, <clears throat> enlarging a part inside the nasal gland, you can see you have a blood capillaries, the red ones, and you have the epithelium of the gland. And you can see that the movement of the salt is opposite to the movement of the blood. This movement, this counter movement in the secretory tubules will lead to movement of, as you can enlarge to enlarge a part, you can see here, this is the blood flow movement opposite to the movement of the salt secretion uh, from the seawater inside the bird. This opposite movement or uh, this counter movement will lead to the movement of the salt from the blood into the, uh, to the lemon of the salt gland. And soon after that, when the salt is collecting in the secretory tubules, it is secreted to the outside through the nostorial. So this salt secretion in the nasal gland of the marine bird is transported from the blood into the secretory tubules and it is drained out leading to the nostorial uh, to the outside. So majorly, the bird have evolved a way of collecting all the salt inside its blood to be secreted to the outside uh, via the nostorial. What about animals? What about animals that live in temporary water? Some aquatic invertebrates in temporary bones lose almost all their body water and they survive in a dormant state. And this, this kind of adaptation is called anhydrobiosis. That means they got hypernate in very amount of water. So you can see this kind of, uh, of uh, animal, it's uh, called uh, tardy grates. In hydrated, that means the environment contains a lot of water, it, it, it lives like this, hydrated uh, tardy grate. While if there is <clears throat> low amount of water, probably it will die if it lives in this state. So in this case, it is transformed to a dehydrated form. In order to conserve energy, this process or this adaptation is called anhydrobiosis. So in this case, it conserves its energy because it will not be able to regulate its body 
and there is no enough water around around itself so it is it, it go into a hibernation process or a dormant state uh, process for land animals it can do adaptation to reduce water loss and this is a very key uh, process for survival so most of the body covering of most terrestrial animal prevent dehydration so this desert animal get major water saving from simple anatomical structure or feature or behavior like living in nocturnal lifestyles يعني الحيوانات اللي عايشين في الصحراء يفضل ان هم يعيشوا اكتر ليليا عن ان هم يعيشوا نهاريا عشان كميه الميه في الليل بتبقى اكتر So land animals maintain the water balance by eating moist food or producing water metabolically through cellular respiration. So you can see here the water balance in a, a kangaroo rat compared to the water balance in human. <clears throat> Normally, the kangaroo rat, this uh, kind of rat, need two milliliter of water per day, while humans need two and a half liter per day of water. So you can see that the water that is derived from food in case of rat, it's around 0.2 of the two mil, while most of the water derived uh, needed by the rat is derived from the metabolism that occur internally inside its, its body. In case of human, the story is different. Most of the two and a half liter of water per day are, get, are, are got from the ingested as a liquid, one and a half liter. A very minimum amount is derived from metabolism, which differ from this rat, while uh, uh, water can be ingested in food. But the major difference between both these animals that here that most of the ingested, uh, liquid, uh, uh, in ingested water comes from drinking liquids while here most of the water needed by the rat is got from the metabolism itself in case of the uh, water loss this figure shows the water gain in case the water loss there is as well as uh, some differences that most of the water loss goes out in the rat through urine uh, through uh, through evaporation but here most of the water loss in humans is through urine okay so this figure shows the difference between water gain and water loss in humans and rat <clears throat> so what is the energetics of osmoregulation osmoregulators that these kinds of animal can regulate their um, osmotic um, uh, status, uh, they must expend energy to maintain osmotic gradients. So the amount of energy differs based on a number of factors, three of factors. How different the animal osmolarity is from its surrounding? So is it hypotonic or hyperosmotic to the hypoosmotic? What is the difference between its surrounding? Second, how easily water and the solute move across the animal surface. Third, the work required to, pulp, to, to pump solutes across the membrane. So all these uh, three factors depend, uh, needs, um, depend on regulation of the osmolarity of the animal. So for concept two, an animal nitrogenous waste can reflect its habitat. So the type of waste can reflect what is the environment around the animal. The type and the quantity of an animal's waste products may greatly affect its water balance. So nitrogenous breakdown products are most significant waste of proteins and the nucleic acids because proteins and nucleic acids are made up uh, largely from uh, beside carbon and hydrogen and nitrogen as well. So what are the forms of nitrogenous waste? Either ammonia, urea, or uric acid. For ammonia, animals that excrete nitrogenous waste as ammonia need access to lots of water. 
They release ammonia across the whole body surface or through the gills. While animals that excrete in the form of urea, it needs the liver of mammals and most adult amphibians convert the ammonia to less toxic urea. So the circulatory system carries urea to the kidneys where it is excreted. The conversion of ammonia to urea is energetically, energetically expensive. So excretion of urea requires less water than ammonia. What about uric acid? In insect land snails and many reptiles, including um, as well birds, mainly excrete uric acid. Uric acid is relatively non-toxic and little water loss uh, as, as, and as well doesn't dissolve readily in water. It can be secreted as a paste with little water loss. The uric acid is more energetically expensive to produce uh, than uh, urea. So, as a general rule here, there is a relation between the type of the nitrogenous waste and the amount of energy needed. So, it's like inversely proportional. So, if you excrete your uric acid, which you produce little amount of water loss, you need more energy. And if, if you excrete, if the animal excrete ammonia, which needs a lot amount of water, these need lesser amount of energy uh, to be expended. So let's see here a diagrammatic sketch showing if you have a protein and a nucleic acid in your body, mainly the proteins consist of amino acids, while the nucleic acids consist of nitrogenous waste. Both of them have amino groups. In case of the most aquatic animal, including most bony fish, it is excreted as ammonia. While in case of mammals, most amphibians, shark, and some bony fishes, it excretes in the form of urea. While the most energetic demanding uh, uh, process is in case of birds and some reptiles, insects, and, uh, and, uh, and many reptiles, insects, land snail, they secrete in the form of uric acid with the least amount of water and with the highest energy demand. Here you can see a table showing the types of denitrogenous waste, the chemical formula, and the advantage and disadvantage of that waste, and as well the condition that favors the, uh, the, uh, uh, this type of waste, as well as uh, the general group of animals that require uh, this uh, kind of uh, uh, waste. So you can see for ammonia, the advantage, it takes almost no energy to produce, but it's highly toxic. While in urea, less toxic and require less water to excrete than, than ammonia, but some, somewhat toxic and require more energy than ammonia to produce. While the last one is the uric acid is non-toxic and insoluble in water and it requires almost no water to excrete, but for the disadvantage, it requires more energy than ammonia and uh, urea to produce. And these two columns, which is only required from this table. Let's see concept three. The diverse excretory system are variation on a tubular theme. Okay, so generally all the excretory system through the animal kingdom are only variation of tube, tube structure. Let's see. The, uh, how, how it occur. Okay. Excretory system regulate, of course, the solute movement between internal fluid and the external environment. This excretory process and the most excretory system produce urine, which, is, which we now can call it filtrate, because it's actually the filtrate from the blood. By a process of pressure filtering body fluid and then modify the filtrate, con filtrate content. So, Let's see the key function of the most excretory system. It starts with filtration, in which in the, in the filtration, there is a filtering of the body fluid, especially for water and solute. And, and you can see here that filtration occurs initially here, okay, in the capsule or the structure here, in which the blood 
enters, enters inside this capsule, which is called Bauman capsule, and passes out after being filtered. So this is the first process of um, um, uh, function, which is the filtration, in which water and the solute are forced by blood pressure across the semi-permeable membrane or selectively, sem se uh, selectively permeable membrane to the tube. The second process is reabsorption. Basically, for reabsorption, the body is reclaiming back any valuable solutes that might go out by the filtrate and get excreted. So in the process of reabsorption, you can see in the excretory tubes that valuable solutes are resorbed back into the bloodstream from the filtrate. While the third process is the secretion, in which from the blood, toxins and the excess ions and waste from body fluid are secreted inside the excretory tube tubules. The fourth process, of course, will be excretion, in which now the filtrate, which have been altered on two levels, a level of reabsorption and the level of secretion, the altered filtrate, which is now called the urine, leaves the system outside from the body. So this is a general plan of the excretory process. So let's see a survey of the excretory systems among some animal groups and how the uh, function is modified based on the animal. So systems that perform this basic function are widely among animal groups. They usually involve a complex network of tubules. Starting with the primitive one, which is called protonephridia. And actually, protonephridia exists as a network of dead-end tubules connecting to external opening. So you can see the tubules of the protonephridia here, and we can enlarge one of them, and you can see how the structure of the protonephridia occur. It consists, as you can see, with a, a, a tubule cell, with a cap cell, and this structure is called the flame bulb. And you can see here the cilia as well, there is cilia inside the tubules. All of them unite and opens into the body wall. So you can see that the opening of the protonephridia is along the body wall of this planaria. It's a primitive worm. So initially, uh, by the beating of the cilia, uh, draw the fluid uh, and filtrate it to pass into the tubule. This filtrate empties to the outside through the opening. So the smallest branch of the network are capped, as we said, by a cellular unit called the uh, flame uh, bulb. These tubules excrete a diluted uh, fluid and function in osmoregulation. So let's see another type of uh, excretory system in another uh, animal, which is the metanephridia. So the one before is called protonephridia, proto means primitive, and then the second one is called metanephridia. In metanephridia, normally exist in worms. You can see it's, a, uh, it's a, the uh, round worms. So this worm, uh, as example, the earthworm. So you can see it, this worm is uh, segmented, is segmented. So in each segment, in each segment, you can see a structure for a metanephridia. And it consists of, uh, has a pair of uh, open-ended metanephridia, okay? And you can see for each segment, there is a pore for the metanephridia to secrete its content uh, the, uh, to the outside. The metanephridia is consists of tubules that coll collect the coelomic, the cavity inside the worm, is called coelom, the coelomic fluid, and they produce diluted, water, uh, diluted urine for excretion through the opening. And you can see here, here is the collecting tubules, and how collecting tubules is, is in close contact with the capillary network in order to filter the blood from the uh, uh, excretory products. And here you can see the structure of a metanephridia. So actually, this is in lar one enlarged segment of the worm. The third type, more advanced type of excretory system is the Malbigian 
uh, tubules, which generally occur in insects. So you can see in insects and terrestrial arth arthropods, you can see that Malpighian tubules are concentrated in the uh, abdomen region. You can see here in the abdomen region. When we enlarge this Malpighian tubule, you can see it consists of Malpighian here is the Malbigian tubules, and this one used to filtrate salt and water and nitrogenous waste from the, uh, from the hemolymph. And the hemolymph represented the blood of the insects. So all of these uh, uh, solutes, uh, salt and water and nitrogenous waste are filtered in the Malbigian tubules and are collected and got excreted from the uh, anus. So here there is no specialized uh, uh, excretory opening. In the, in, the rectum, in the rectum, there is reabsorption of the valuable products like water ions and valuable organic uh, molecules. So the Malbigian tubules are out, you can see it's an out book, bucket of the digestive uh, tract that removes nitrogenous waste and as well function in osmoregulation. Insects produce relatively dry waste matter, mainly of, in the form of uric acid. Some terrestrial insects can also take up water from the air. So let's go to the more advanced excretory system in mammals. So kidneys are the main excretory organ of vertebrates and they function for both excretion and osmoregulation. If you look through the excretory organ in mammals, you can see it, it consists of two kidneys uh, connected together to a bladder, urinary bladder through a ureter to ureter and open to the outside by the urethra. You can see as well that there is a renal artery that enters the kidney and there is a renal vein that leaves from the kidney. The renal artery comes from the posterior vena cava, while the renal veins, uh, the renal veins collect to the main, uh, main uh, um, vein that goes to the vein, to main vein that um, renal, renal artery and vein, you can see here. Okay. If you enlarge one of the kidney, you will find that it is consists of majorly two regions: a renal cortex, this a big part, and the renal medulla, which is inside. In the middle, there is a region which we, which is called renal pelvis. This a kidney, uh, con, uh, as we said, there is a renal artery entering the kidney, and there is a renal vein collecting blood from the kidney. If you enlarge one of the uh, sections of the kidney, you can see the structure of the basic unit of the kidney, which is the nephron. So here it is enlarged part of the uh, kidney. So you can see here the renal cortex and you can see here the renal medulla. In the kidney, you can see uh, two types of nephron. So what is nephron? Nephron is the basic unit of the kidney which is responsible actually for uh, the excretion. So you can see that there are two types of the nephrons. A cortical nephron, which is majorly exists in the cortical region, and a juxtamedullary nephron, which is uh, kind of shifted downward, and uh, there is a, a, lot, a, 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 a long, a long uh, uh, structure of the tubules uh, is deep inside the medulla. So these are the two different types of the nephrons. If we enlarge one nephron to see its structure, we'll talk in details, you can see that uh, there is, the nephron is taught by, by a Bauman a capsule. Inside the Bauman capsule, there's a network of capillaries, which is called a glomerulus, which comes from the afferent arteriole from the renal artery. Soon after that, the Bauman capsule lead to the proximal tubule, which leads to the uh, a loop of hen. You can see loop of hen. And loop of hen is consists of two parts, descending limb and the ascending limb. After the ascending milk, uh, limb, you will have the uh, uh, distal uh, convoluted tubules, which will, shun, which will soon, each distal convoluted tubule will uh, uh, pour uh, into the collecting duct. So you can see here the collecting ducts, which soon will merge and uh, get out of the kidney through the uh, uh, urethra or the ureter. So you can see here how blood is sublying. So the artery is sublying the Bauman capsule, and soon it breaks down into the capillaries, 
in which the capillaries uh, uh, in, uh, mix between and get um, merged between the tubules for the process, as we said before, the reabsorption and the secretion. And we will talk uh, in details about the mechanism of that. Soon after that, the veins are collected, all these capillaries are collected into uh, the branches of renal vein that come out of the kidney as a renal vein. Here you can see again the structure of a nephron. So you can see the whole kidney with the renal cortex, renal medulla, and renal pelvis. And you can see that the, the uh, 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 renal artery which enters the kidney and the renal vein which collect uh, from the kidney the blood. And you can see this as well here. Here is the uh, uh, um, uh, way out from the uh, kidney in the form of ureter which leads to outside by the urine. So actually, this, your, uh, this ureter actually inside the kidney basically consists of merging of all the collecting duct. If we enlarge again one part, will you see the structure of the nephron, which is uh, distributed uh, among the uh, medulla and the cortex. Going again to the same figure to, for more uh, clarification, you can see the uh, uh, glomerulus capsule, capsule here, leads to proximal uh, tubule, leads to a loop of hand descending and then ascending, and then you have here a distal uh, tubule, all merge to the collecting duct, which lead to renal pelvis, and then all collecting ducts are merged to form uh, the uh, ureter. And you can see how the network of blood capillaries are all around the uh, loop of hand and the nephron. So if we wanted to summarize the regions of the nephron, it starts with glomerulus capsule, and then you have proximal tubule, and then you have loop of hand descending and then ascending limb, and then you have a distal tubule, and then you have a collecting ducts to convey uh, the filtrate into the renal uh, pelvis. So let's go deeper into what's happening inside the nephron. So again, you can see here the glomerulus uh, covering and enclosing the Bauman cap, uh, the, sorry, the Bauman capsule enclosing the glomerulus. And actually the glomerulus is a tuft of uh, capillaries that come from the uh, afferent arteriole uh, of the uh, renal artery and lead after that, uh, after leaving the nephron, leads to the afferent uh, arteriole of the renal artery. So if we enlarge uh, more on the structure of the Bauman capsule, you can see the Bauman capsule and then inside it, there is a glomerulus and the afferent and the afferent uh, uh, capillary. So what's the basic process, as we said before? Here is the Bauman capsule, as we said, uh, containing the glomerulus, and here is the afferent, and here is the efferent coming to the outside. Initially, the filtration occurs in the Bauman capsule, followed by reabsorption occurs in the tubule, and secretion as well of the um, uh, waste product uh, uh, inside the uh, filtrate to form a urine that goes outside uh, uh, through excretion. So these are the three major uh, processes that occur uh, uh, in the nephron. So look at, looking more closer, uh, for convenience, uh, this uh, diagram shows uh, the two regions, the renal cortex on top and the renal medulla. And you can see that the nephron is uh, 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 distributed among the two uh, uh, regions of the kidney. So here we'll talk about the urine formation and how the urine is concentrated. Uh, for convenience, the arrow, uh, arrow one, this arrow, the yellow, yellow arrow represents the filtration, while this uh, pink arrow, reabsorption, while this arrow is uh, secretion, the three major uh, processes, while the last one, the asterisk uh, arrow with the pink arrow represent where hydrogen is reabsorption and if ADH is present. What's ADH? ADH is the antidiuretic hormone and it is released inside our body. If it's released in high amount in our body, it will retain water and it will not enable a lot of water to be excreted in the urine. So it, uh, ADH majorly prevent the uh, diluted urine. So let's see what's happening. So initially the blood is incoming through the afferent, 
in the uh, uh, glomerulus, and these uh, glomerulus uh, capillaries, uh, and there is a process of filtration, as you can see from the arrow. All of the all the filtrate is collected in the proximal tubules, and soon after the blood releases its content, its uh, waste content, it will be collected uh, now uh, outgoing. Uh, and now it is uh, clear. So now the filtrate moves inside the a proximal distal tubule in which if a reabsorption occur as, as indicated by the arrow and the process of secretion of uh, water and solute occur. In the lobe of Henry, you can see the blood capillary as well is moving parallel to the uh, 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 loop of the nephron. So you can see that there is a process again of reabsorption of water through the uh, descending loop and the ascending loop. And as well, there is a process of water and as well uh, sodium chloride. So you can see that after that, it continues for the process of uh, reabsorption and secretion as well, until reaching here uh, again, uh, water is reabsorbed in this region of distal tubules, until finally collected inside the collecting duct. In the collecting duct, uh, two major things occur as well. Reabsorption is water of water again occur. The only difference with the asterisk is that this occur only if ADH is present. So that means the body understands that it needs to retain more water. And as well, uh, the urea is, uh, 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 is uh, secreted. Okay. So soon after that, the urine is formed to the renal pelvis and then out to the, ure uh, out to the ureter. Again, for a more clear uh, picture on, of what is happening, uh, you can see here the glomerulus. A lot of ions and water are, uh, are moving. The, the difference here that it shows the kind of movement either by osmosis, and osmosis uh, explains only the movement of water from high water into low water potential. That means from diluted water into concentrated, uh, from diluted solution into concentrated solution. And as well, the second type of movement is active transport in which the movement needs uh, energy. And the third one is diffusion. It is a movement of materials from high concentration into low concentration. So these color coding arrows represent uh, the type of movement that is needed to move the molecule. So you can see here that sodium and, uh, and the hydrogen and some drugs needs uh, energy, so they move by active transport, while um, uh, potassium and all, all of these ions, bicarbonate, calcium, chlor chloride, and potassium, uh, doesn't need any energy and, and move outside by diffusion outside of the tubule. While the water here, you can see in this region, in the proximal tubule, it moves to the outside by osmosis from diluted into uh, concentrated. Then you move to the descending loop and you can see that move water as well moves by, uh, dilute, uh, moves by osmosis. Going to the ascending tubules, you see that sodium chloride is reabsorbed back by active transport. Some uh, at, at the end of the distal tubule by uh, active transport, while at the initially it moves by diffusion. Soon after, in the distal tubules, you can see all the three mechanisms, either active transport for ions, uh, diffusion for bicarbonate, and uh, uh, as well as osmosis for water. Uh, keep in mind that asterisk here denotes, denotes only or represent only water is reabsorbed. You can see asterisk here, asterisk here, asterisk here, asterisk here. It only uh, represent water is reabsorbed in case if ADH is present. And again, what is ADH? ADH is the antidiuretic hormone which uh, orders the, the nephron to reabsorb more, more water, okay? Because the body needs more water, like in cases uh, if the animal uh, lives in desert. After that, all, all the uh, collecting ducts, all the merging of the nephrons into different, in the collecting ducts are collected to the renal pelvis and then to the outside through the uh, ureter. You can see the process of reabsorption and secretion mainly occur throughout the whole nephron. And in the collecting duct, you can see the, the process of concentration of the urine, while in the glomerulus is responsible only for filtration of the blood. So basically, this figure 
uh, shows how ions are moved and are moved from the tubule to the blood or vice or to the blood capillary or vice versa and what is the type of movement of these uh, 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 solutes here again basically it's the same figure uh, much uh, simpler to differentiate between active and passive transport. You can see it's actually the same, showing the ions which are occurring in the proximal tubules, the ions which are occurring in the distal tubules, reabsorbed, and the reabsorption of water in the descending limb of uh, the nephron, and the, the uh, reabsorption of sodium chloride. And uh, as you can see, initially in the, in the ascending limb, uh, the sodium chloride is uh, reabsorbed by passive, and then by active transport in the thicker, thicker segment of the ascending of the uh, uh, of the ascending limb. And you can see here the regions of the uh, kidney, there is cortex and the medulla. Even the medulla have an outer medulla and the inner medulla. So you can we can say here that the passive transport of urea is the passive transport or the reabsorption of urea water and the sodium chloride in the inner medulla occur by passive transport while in the uh, uh, outer medulla it occur by active transport. Here you can see it uh, just a list which is showing what is the filtrate uh, contain. So basically you can see some valuable uh, products like glucose and amino acid. This uh, product can be reabsorbed if the body is needing that these uh, product, these valuable uh, molecules. So for force concept, continuing the force concept, the nephron is organized for step processing of blood filtrate. Here in this slide, we'll summarize what we have just said. So the filtrate produced in the Bauman capsules containing salts, glucose, amino acids, vitamin, nitrogenous waste, and other small molecules. In the proximal tubules, there is a reabsorption of ions, waters, nutrients takes place in the proximal tubules. The molecules are transported actively and passively as we, uh, as, as we have just seen in the figure. From the filtrate into the interstitial fluid and then capillaries, toxic material are actively stay in the filtrate or secreted in the filtrate, into the filtrate. As the filtrate pass through the proximal tubule, it becomes more concentrated. In the descending limb of the lobe of Henle, th there is a reabsorption of water continuous through important protein uh, channel, it's called aquaporin. The high osmolarity of interstitial fluid, this drive the movement. So the filtrate become increasingly concentrated. During, the, uh, during movement in ascending limb of the lobe of Henle, the salt but not water as you, as, as you have just seen from um, the figure, the salt, not water, is able, is able to reab, be, uh, reabsorb, to diffuse back from the tubule into the interstitial, interstitial fluid and then to the blood, while the filtrate now become increasingly diluted. For the distal tubule, the distal tubule regulates the amount and concentration of potassium and sodium chloride of body fluids. In the collecting ducts, the collecting ducts collect everything from all the nephrons and carries this filtrate through the inner mid outer medulla, then the inner medulla, then the renal pelvis, and now the urine is hyperosmotic to body fluid and need to be excreted to the outside. So what is the adaptation of the vertebrate kidney to, to diverse environment? The form of the and the function of the nephron, which is the basic unit of the kidney, in various vertebrate classes are related to the requirement of osmoregulation in the animal habitat. So you can see in the mammals, there is juxta medullary nephron. If you remember, this is a nephron which, which is distributed among the medulla and the cortex, is key to water conservation in terrestrial animal. The mammals that inhabit dry environment have very long, have long lobe of handle, while those in fresh water have relatively short loops. That's a major difference between the type of habitat, between, uh, that's a major difference, reflect the type of habitat and the structure of lobe of handle. Uh, 
In birds and other reptiles, birds have shorter uh, lobe of hands, but conserve water by excreting uric acid. If you remember, instead of urea, if you remember, uric acid is uh, is uh, excreted, which need very less amount, even none water, no water at all, and but needs a lot of energy to produce this uric acid. Reptiles have only cortical nephrons. As you remember, if you remember, we have two types of nephron, cortical and juxta medullary nephrons. For reptiles have only cortical uh, nephrons, but also excrete nitrogenous waste in the form of uric acids. For freshwater fishes and amphibians, the freshwater fishes conserve salt in the distal tubules and excrete large amount of diluted urine. They are, they are already living, uh, 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 living in water. While amphibians conserve water on land by reabsorption, by reabsorbing water from the urinary bladder. For the marine bony fishes, these marine bony fishes are hyposmotic compared to, to their environment because their environment are hyper. Their kidney has a small glomeruli and, and some lake the glomeruli entirely. So the process of filtration is very diminished in this marine bony fish. The filtration rate, of course, will be very low and very little urine is excreted. So vertebrate urinary system help to maintain homeostasis in several ways including, of course, regulating small organic nutrients and ions within the blood and interstitial fluids, regulating water and the ion content of blood to maintain the proper blood osmolarity, maintaining the proper pH of the blood by regulating the amount of hydrogen and the bicarbonate that is reabsorbed and excreted to the kidney. And of course, secreting substance that help regulate blood pressure and the blood oxygen uh, content. And this uh, concludes uh, our lecture uh, for the uh, urinary system and the osmoregulation. Uh,